This book is a self-help book. Its objective, as it says on the cover, is to show you how to get filthy rich in rising Asia. And to do that, it has to find you, huddled, shivering, on the packed earth under your mother's cot one cold, dewy morning. Your anguish is the anguish of a boy whose chocolate has been thrown away, whose remote controls are out of batteries, whose scooter is busted, whose new sneakers have been stolen. This is all the more remarkable since you've never in your life seen any of these things. A particular pleasure this week to have the Pakistani novelist Mohsin Hamid back on the show. He is, of course, the very well-known author of both Moth Smoke and The Reluctant Fundamentalist, the latter made into a film by Mira Nair, which is soon going to be having its international premiere. But his new novel, acclaimed critically and around the world, is possibly the most masterful of his works. It's called How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia written in an even more innovative format as a self-help guide. Most in such a pleasure to have you. I've been glued to your book, as indeed uh, have readers and critics uh, on, on three continents. It's been out in America and in Europe and to widespread critical acclaim. Now, how to get filthy rich in rising Asia, apart from its uh, brilliant title, uh, is, is the novel that's actually taken you quite long to write, six years for a very short novel. Yes, it, uh, uh, it has been six years and it isn't very long. It's a couple hundred pages at most. And um, partly it took that long because I was trying to figure out how to write it. You know, the first two or three years that I worked on this book, I've thrown away all of those pages and not even a sentence survived. Um, it was one of these novels that uh, it took a long time to figure out how, how to make it work. Right. What's unique about it, again, as with your previous two novels, is its uh, literary form. It's, it's, told, uh, it's told in the second person, the nameless narrator being you, and uh, also the reader is addressed as you. So there's this, uh, there's this very exciting coalescing of, of both the speaker and the reader, but also the whole book, its format, is devised as a how-to guide. Yes, um, it started as a joke, the notion that, you know, a friend and I were, were joking about um, literature. Self-help books. Yes, self-help books. Literature being hard work to read and maybe we do it because it's good for us and maybe it's sort of self-help. And I had jokingly said, my next novel will be a self-help book. And then I thought about it and I thought, you know, what am I doing when I write novels, sitting by myself in a room for years upon years? Maybe it is a kind of self-help. And maybe even reading novels is a kind of self-help. And the joke became very earnest. And so both playing with the idea and exploring it seriously at the same time began. Right. The Reluctant Fundamentalist, uh, of course, was unique in, in a similarly innovative technique by using a singular dramatic monologue. One character telling his story. He had a name, of course, Chang is. Uh, this narrator. Uh, in, in a self-help help guide, a self-improvement guide, is really telling his life story in chapters, each an exhortation or aphorism, or even some of them sound like uh, branded devices, not surprising coming from a former brand consultant, uh, how to get an education, how to move to the city, how not to fall in love, etc., etc., etc. How did you formulate that strategic kind of format? Well, I thought I wanted to write two books in one. One was the superstructure of a novel that really is, in a way, how to get rich. And we follow this character from a poor village to the city as he moves up socioeconomic classes, starts a business, does a variety of semi-nefarious activities, and makes his fortune. Um, but against that narrative of growth, I wanted to also build this love story. And actually, sequence of love stories, love for his parents, love for his siblings, but above all, love for this pretty girl that he meets as a teenager and stays in love with until his death. He's only known as pretty girl yes. throughout. Yes. And, and because I thought, you know, the market and the way we talk about getting rich and having more GDP and more income and more cars, that narrative is invariably a narrative of growth. But human existence is equally a narrative of loss. You know, we lose our health, we lose our loved ones, and in the end, we lose our lives. And the market doesn't really have a vocabulary for that. So I thought by building this market story, I could also explore 
in a sense, the deeper story, which is a story of loss and a story of love.